You know, my favorite book of the Bible is Matthew. And um, so almost any chance I get, I like to not talk about Matthew, but talk about Jesus according to Matthew. Um, not that that's any necessarily any better than Jesus according to John or Luke or Paul for that matter. Um, but I just, uh, for some reason, you know, everybody's got their thing, you know. Yeah. For some reason, I just like Matthew's view of Jesus. It's very specific, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's distinctive. It's a little bit different than, than, say, John's look at Jesus. Now, they're all looking at the same Jesus, and they all see the same Jesus, but that, you know, everybody's got a different perspective. They notice different things about him, things like that, different sometimes different stories a little bit about him. And um, so I thought that since I had a chance to talk about Jesus from Matthew's perspective, I was going to do it three times because I'm given three, what, three Wednesdays this, this month. So I'm going to, and, and we're not going to be talking about the same thing each Wednesday, but uh, we're going to be talking about Jesus according to Matthew each each Wednesday. So each Wednesday I'm going to kind of try to find a little bit different angle that Matthew comes at with Jesus. And um, and this week I thought we'd talk about the rebel king. Because there are so many different things to find when you're looking at Jesus. You know, so many different things to see. You can, you can read about Jesus uh, three different times in a day and see three different things. And not that you're seeing, again, not that you're seeing the different Jesus, but you're just seeing, th- because there's so much to him, obviously. Um, and I just thought that it was interesting that Matthew presents Jesus as the king. The king that Israel has been looking for. And I apologize that your handouts are so light. Hopefully everybody can see him okay. Um but uh, I've, uh, some of my sermon I kind of pre-prepared and I, I pre-printed. So if you see me going like this and just reading, I have to do that to, to kind of get through this a little bit. So um, this, this series uh, that we're in, it's going to go this week, next week, and then not the week after, but the week after that. Okay. So we're going to be, uh, uh, this part of the series this week, we're going to be talking about Jesus as the rebel king. Or let's just start talking about Jesus as a king, first of all. Um, forget the idea that he's a rebel. Uh, we'll we'll kind of get to that. It sounds kind of strange, but we'll get to that. Um, so, of course, he is not an evil rebel. He doesn't rebel against God. Uh, he confronts the worst in us and our attempts to gain righteousness on our own terms. Okay, So he responds to that by kind of turning our world upside down a little bit. Um, and through it all, he's, he's still a rebel, but he's the good rebel that turns us back to God. Um, so as we look at Matthew, we notice that this is one of four gospel accounts. Uh, we know the other three, uh, what Mark, Luke, and John. Um, each one has many distinctive features, and also each gospel has a certain voice and a particular audience. And we'll kind of we'll kind of get more into that, not just later this week, but in the next couple weeks. Um, So Matthew's voice was that of a Jew. He was Jewish. Um, His audience was Jewish. Um, And although anyone could read it, um, it it, his gospel isn't just for Jews, obviously. But a Jewish person would read it and pick up on certain things. Pick up on a little kind of a Jewish drumbeat, as it were to the song, whereas maybe some other people might miss that particular aspect. Um, So yeah, we're going to look at some of the distinctive features of Matthew, the the kind of Jewish distinctive features. And so it doesn't matter to me so much that it is Jewish, it just happens to be Jewish. And it is important that that it is a Jewish viewpoint for a few reasons that we'll get into. So I'm not harping on this Jewish thing just just for no reason. So if you happen to have your Bibles, turn with me to the very beginning of Matthew. Like literally just your first chapter, your first page. 
And obviously, we're not going to have time to really go through every single verse and chapter in Matthew to find out all these features. But I just thought I would kind of bring us to a couple, three of them, that are very prominent. So the first chapter, uh, the introduction, um, you can kind of read through it, you know, as I'm talking here, the introduction. Jesus' genealogy is distinctively Jewish. Uh, it begins with Abraham. Notice that, that Matthew is tracing Jesus' genealogy not from him back, but he's starting in, in his past with a very specific person. And who is that? It's Abraham. It's not just any person. And he's not starting a certain time ago. It's with a very specific person. Um, so it begins with Abraham. And who is Abraham? He's the father of the covenantal faith. Not just of Jews, obviously, but all believers in God, uh, Christians. Um, and it runs through King David. So you'll notice, um, you'll go down, I guess in uh, my, my Bible has it printed about a paragraph later, you, later you'll notice that um, David is mentioned there in verse 8, or excuse me, verse 6, sorry. So we're starting at Abraham going through a few people whose names I dare not even try to pronounce. Um, and we're getting to David, going through yet a few more names, uh, and then eventually it arrives to Jesus. So it's kind of an interesting way to do a family tree. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I have to start with me and then go back and back and back. So if anybody has anything to, to say about my background, they have to start with me and go back. Matthew is starting with Abraham and coming to Jesus as though Jesus is kind of the ultimate, you know, the end of your story is kind of the, a really important part. And so the end of his genealogy is none other than Jesus. So that kind of gives Jesus a place of prominence, oddly enough, in a genealogy that includes Abraham and King David, of all people. So I, I just wanted to point that out. So uh, even the first sentence uh, mentions Jesus in the context of these two guys. It says, the, verse, uh, the first verse, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So it's very important to Matthew that he is related and directly related to these two guys. So uh, the reader also understands from Matthew that Jesus was an observant Jew of his day, uh, honoring the temple and the Jewish high holidays, uh, but there's more to Jesus than being an observant Jew. Uh, again, we don't have time to read through Matthew, but we remember some of those stories, even when um, Jesus was a child, uh, about 12 years old, uh, his mom and dad thought he was with them as they were traveling away from the temple, uh, but they had to turn around and go find him in the temple. Being an observant Jew, uh, worshiping God, talking about the scripture uh, with people in the temple. So uh, Matthew, like the other gospel writers, mentions the kingdom of God. Uh, one of the reasons that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is mentioned over 50 times in Matthew uh, is that his intention is to portray, portray Jesus as the true king, um, the, the true and final king over Israel and all the nations. Um, so again, uh, you know the, the whole kingdom idea. We're we're going to get more into that, but that's that's a very kind of um, well, it's very important to Matthew, and that's kind of why it's important to me this week. Um, I'm going to read a quote uh, by a um, uh, a theologian who's written a commentary on Jesus. He says. More important than his portrayals of Jesus as a teacher or prophet, which is important, Matthew hails Jesus as the true king of Israel, that is, the Messiah or Christ or anointed one. Jesus' teachings have such a special authority for Matthew's Jewish Christian audience uh, precisely because he is, God, uh, he is God's appointed king. Okay, so it, again, you know, the king idea actually kind of ties in with the fact that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ or literally the anointed one, God's anointed one, uh, special one, uh, anointed for a very specific, special purpose. 
So, have you ever noticed, reading in Matthew, that not once does it mention the kingdom of God? you ever noticed that? He calls it the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is a phrase that you'll find uh, in John, I believe, quite a bit, and uh, the, other, the other two Gospels. Why do you suppose that is? I was, I was actually kind of shocked to find out. Um, you know, I, and again, I got this from, from a few commentaries, and it, it's not a secret. It's just that most people, it's, it's one of those things that nobody's trying to hide the information from you. It's just that, you, you know, we can live life without that. We can drive to the store and get our food without that information. We can get to work. But, you know, you find out things. And I found out that Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven, not mentioning God specifically, because it's a way to revere God by not pronouncing his name. And that's what the Jews did uh, back then. I honestly don't know how what they do today. Um, but uh, at, certainly at the time of the writing uh, uh, of Matthew's Gospel, he knew that when you're in, when you're in public and you, you, know, you want to talk about God, you sort of talk around him. And not because you're ashamed of him or anything, it's because you revere God so much and he, God, remember, God gave the Jews a very personal name. He, he, did, he didn't just say, oh, just call me God or one of the gods or a god on the mountain or something. Uh, he gave them a divine name. It's, it's that, that Yahweh or the, the Y-H-W-H. Um, even the, the Y-H-W-H is there. It's just the consonants because you don't pronounce the vowel or you, there's no vowels in there because we don't pronounce it. So, Interestingly enough, you know, Matthew wanted to, you know, uh, this is another kind of um, uh, sort of way that Matthew is writing to Jews because he didn't want to offend Jews by saying God this, God that, God all the time because it's sort of, um, that's one of the ways that they revere God just by allowing him to be God and God has that special name that he gave to you and it's so special you don't want to just go spouting it off all the time, I suppose. Um, so, uh, you'll see in your notes there a few references to various parts of Matthew. There's Matthew 2, Matthew 21, Matthew 25, and so on, all the way to 27. I would like us to read those together. Um, so, if you happen to have your Bibles or, or you're sitting next to somebody who's got a Bible, um, Please feel free to read along with me. And I do something uh, that I, I can't remember if I did it here last, but I usually do it at other churches that we used to go to. I like, I like us all to read together. Not all in unison necessarily, but, um, but if you happen to have a Bible and you would like to read one of these passages, uh, raise your hand or just, just let me know. Say, hey, I got this one or I, I got that one. I would like us, as part of our study, to read these passages aloud to each other. So I'll, I'm going to go ahead and read that Matthew 2, 1 there. It, starts, uh, it actually starts in verse 1, but it goes through Matthew 2, 6. So, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east, or magi, came uh, to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, For so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Okay, this is interesting. You notice the first time a king is mentioned, it's the Magi saying, they're going to Herod, saying, Oh, hey, where's this king that everybody's talking about? 
You notice in the very next verse, verse 3, it says, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. So now we've got already, in the early stages of Matthew, we've got two kings. One is being recognized by the people, so to speak. Uh, the Magi, yes, they were wise men from the east, but in, they were not the king, certainly. But then we have the, you know, Herod the king. He was troubled, of course. He's kind of wondering, hey, what's, what's going on with this? I thought I was king. Um, and so he's, he, yeah, he, he's getting troubled. He's starting to get nervous. Next time a king is mentioned, you notice down in Matthew 2, 6, for from the prophet says, "For from you shall come a ruler, or a king." Uh, Herod, I'm sure, didn't really love having this piece of scripture read to him. Um, uh, I would probably be troubled myself, huh? <laughs> so we've got a king. We've got a king already. And interestingly enough, you notice that, of course, Herod himself is not believing this. He's like, okay, what's going on? There's some sort of sedition or rebellion brewing, perhaps, at the worst. Or at the very least, it's just somebody's got their facts wrong, um, just trying to stir up trouble, rumors. But you'll notice that Matthew put this in here anyway. You know, because Matthew's got a story to tell. He's got a very specific story about Jesus to tell. He doesn't want to talk about the early years, Jesus when he was a toddler. You know, he doesn't want to talk about this or that or uh, what Jesus cooked for dinner this one night. He's got a very specific message. And of all the, the good things that he could say about Jesus, he wanted, to, he wanted Israel. He wanted Israel to read his gospel. He, I'll bet you he printed that thing off and he, he was saying, I'll bet you he said to himself, I want Israel specifically to read it my Jewish brothers and sisters to read about this guy and recognize that he is our king before he's the king of anybody else of any other nation before he's their king he's our king and he's our king according to our own scripture whoops um, so I, I think it's interesting that Matthew puts this in you know he didn't have to tell this story he could have just skipped over it or told something else maybe that happened at the same time. But interestingly enough, he's, he's showing a little bit of trouble brewing because of the king. Um, do I have a volunteer maybe to read the next passage from Matthew, what is it, 21? If not, I'm comfortable just reading all of this. I just didn't want anybody to get tired of my voice. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it, yeah, no problem. Okay, so I, the reason that I had all these scriptures, are, are, did I print them all out in the notes on one line together, I think? I think I just printed them all together. Um, because these are all sort of, I think Matthew did it in a lot of other places, but I wanted to highlight these five or six scriptures because I think they're some of Matthew's strongest showings that he's talking about a king here. And, of course, at this time, he, uh, Jesus was very young, too, too young to rule in the eyes of the world. But let's go on. I'm going to read Matthew 21. Um, I'm in verse 1. If you happen to have your Bible open, follow along with me. Uh, now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them all at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on, or, and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting. They were shouting, 
Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Again, this is another bit of information, a little scene from Jesus' life that Matthew didn't have to tell. In fact, maybe he could have told about it and just said something different like, oh, well, and then Jesus came down the road. He started here and he ended up right there. He could have said that. But, he noted, and you know, notice also that Jesus wasn't riding on a horse, a grand war horse, you know, that weighs half a ton, you know, with armor. He's riding on a donkey. Interesting. So, Matthew, this is another scene from, from Matthew's perspective about Jesus. This is, this, we're kind of building up here. This is giving Jesus a bit more and more royalty all the time. Matthew 25. I'll go ahead and read that next one. From Matthew 25, and I'll start in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I don't know about you, but if somebody is going to be doing that, they're probably a king or some kind of ruler. Because I don't think I'd ever, I don't think I'm ever going to be in the position to be doing something like that. Matthew is talking about a king. Now, this is, this is Jesus who is saying this, but he's saying this about himself. And you'll notice that the, the first thing that Jesus calls himself, he, he calls himself the Son of Man. That's another term that will... Um, I don't know if we'll really need to get into that for, the Matthew, for our Matthew series here. The Son of Man carries with it, that term carries with it a lot of power. Uh, and... Uh, it comes from Daniel, um, uh, talking about how. Oh boy, I wish we could get into Daniel. I don't have enough time. I need to focus. <laughs> Sorry, and I also need to grab my water here. The Son of Man is something that Jesus called himself in humility, but it is a term that only Jesus could hold. So next we're going to go to Matthew 27. This is very short. These, the rest of these are much shorter. Matthew 27:11, and I hope I have these references printed correctly in the in your notes. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, "Are you the king of the Jews?" Jesus said, "You have said so." Now do we remember who the governor is? Pilate. Remember this. Remember, and, and uh, they were before the people, and Pilate was talking, addressing the people. But he took Jesus aside, and he said a couple things to him. One of them was this. Are you the king of the Jews? And he, because he had heard this, and he was thinking, i got to see what this guy says. You know, I don't know what Pilate was thinking, if he was thinking that maybe really Jesus could be the king of the Jews, or maybe he was testing Jesus. Maybe he thought Jesus was just some ordinary guy that was maybe a, a little bit kind of maybe funny in the head. You know, so he thought, he want, so thought he'd test him out. Are you the king of the Jews? I don't know what he was thinking, but he, he did ask the question. And Matthew records that. Jesus said, you have said so. Now, this is an interesting little scenario. That whole scene isn't much longer than what I just read, at least not in Matthew. Uh, there's not a whole lot else to it, but it's interesting, again, it's interesting that Matthew talks about this. Again, this is another scene that Matthew doesn't have to write about. He could have just ignored that. Maybe, you know, Who knows, maybe when it happened all the people were gathered before Pilate and it happened, who knows, maybe a couple minutes, and then Pilate came back out with Jesus or something. So it could very well have been just a very short 
thing that Matthew could have skipped over. But I think Matthew wanted to include this because he had a drumbeat to keep. Every time that he mentions that, there's another drumbeat all the way through Matthew of the king. Jesus is a king. So, Matthew 27, I'm going to go down to uh, uh, verse 28 in Matthew 27. And we all know this scene. We all know what's going on here. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, as though it were a scepter. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. When I first read that, I got sick. It's, it's not fun to read things like that. Not about not imagining the lover of our souls, Jesus in that position. But it happened. Matthew may possibly have actually seen that one happen. Uh, Of course, he was a great interviewer. He interviewed a lot of people to put together his gospel. There's a lot of things he saw himself that he didn't need to interview for. He may have actually seen that. But whether he did or not, he included it. And again, I say that this is another drumbeat. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. And guess what? I think this shines as a testimony to Jesus' royalty, to his kingship, just as much as talking about the Son of Man coming on his clouds of glory. I think this shines just as much. It shows the servant Jesus because he didn't have to take that. We know he didn't have to take that. So, the last one I want to point to regarding the last uh, scripture I want to point to regarding Jesus' kingship is again in Matthew 27, but farther down to verse 41. So here it says, So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Again, another drum beat. It's it's sort of like Matthew. I can hear Matthew saying between the lines here, you people don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're saying. You need to listen to my drum beat. So, Jesus is king. Um, I think Matthew has pretty much proven himself just in the few scriptures that I pointed out that Jesus is king. Uh, but I am going to go right at, go right ahead and switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about Jesus as a rebel before we wrap this up. Because I believe Jesus was a rebel. And again, I'm not talking about Jesus being a rebel in a bad way because, you know, that sort of has negative connotations. But just in the simplest, purest form of the word rebel, uh, it's it's not necessarily bad. It could be good. It just depends on what you're rebelling against. So so it is established already that Matthew uh, wants us to see that Jesus is the king that Israel needs, uh, even though he may not be the king that Israel wants or even recognizes. God is establishing Jesus as a rebel king who sets himself up against the limitations and the narrow expectations of those who have placed God in a box. And I'm going to repeat that, and, and we'll be fleshing this out here. God is establishing Jesus as a rebel king who sits him who sets himself against the limitations and the narrow expectations of those who have placed God in a box. Because when I obviously we know when I place God in a box and he's my personal little vending machine and he does whatever I want, he's not so big that he expects things from me. He's in he's in this nice little place where I can just just go on Sunday or just go to church and worship him and then we'll leave him in his box there at church and walk away. 
We know that's natural for us as humans to do sometimes. Sometimes more than others. Right here. Um, but Jesus, or but God is setting Jesus up as a rebel king who rebels against that idea, against those narrow, that narrow mindset that we get sometimes of just viewing God as, as being in a box. So we're, as to flesh this out, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, case in point, the Sermon on the Mount. It's two chapters long in Matthew, but it might as well be 200 chapters long because it's so famous. It's big. Who hasn't heard of the Sermon on the Mount? Most, I'll bet you most non-Christians who have never read the Bible in their lives or never been to church have heard of the Sermon on the Mount. They don't know anything about that. Who was it? Who gave that sermon? What mountain was it? You know. Well, I would like us not to not not to read the entire two chapters. We don't have time for that. But I would like to point out a certain portion of chapter five. So again, if you have your Bibles um, and you'd like to follow along, chapter five. I'm going to start in verse twenty-one. Sorry. Um, and let me ask you for those of you who have your notes in front of you did I I am so sorry about this I, I, I printed them out so I know how to talk about them here but I forgot did I print uh, print out the, the verse references in chapter 5 I didn't print that out I'm so sorry about that I apologize but yeah but yeah okay thank you um, so I'm uh, Again, I'm in chapter 5, and um, this is interesting. We, we, we all know it. We, we all remember this. Even if you don't have your Bibles in front of you, you'll go, oh yeah, I've heard that before. So, Jesus quotes the law of Moses in a few places in chapter 5 by saying, you have heard that it was said of... Uh, who, excuse me. You have heard that it was said of those of old, or by those of old. But then he says he says what he has to say, and then he says, "But I say unto you this." Okay, so he's got a little formula that he says. He says uh, again, it, it's in chapter five. He starts in verse twenty-one. It's also in twenty-seven, tw- thirty-one, thirty-three, thirty-eight, and forty-three. So if you have your Bibles open, uh, just just listen to me talking, but keep your eyes perused over that section of Matthew. And you'll see it multiple times, quite a few times. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said by those of old, but I say unto you. And he, you know, he talks about various things. Um, but I, just, I didn't want to actually read through those. I just wanted to point them out. Because what he's doing here, um, yeah, it, basically he's establishing his authority. Okay, so if Jesus is quoting the law of Moses, and then he kind of he kind of comes out from that and he says, "But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you something." What is Jesus doing? He's doing a lot of things, I think, and I, I think it's not worthy of just an instant answer. Oh, here's what he's doing. I think it's I think it's something to think about. If Jesus is quoting the law of Moses. And then he says, but I say unto you. That's interesting. Because, boy, if, if you're a first century Jew and somebody's quoting the law of Moses, that's one thing. But if they follow that up with saying, oh, by the way, but I've got something to say about that. First of all, I don't know about you, but if I was a first century Jew, I would laugh. I would, I would be like... Okay, you you have some. You're going to quote scripture, and then you're going to comment on it. Like you have something to add to it, right? That's. I mean, that's dangerous. You know, it's dangerous for our own sanity. I think, uh, among other things. But Jesus obviously is not just anybody, and he's at this point he's got crowds following him by the thousands. There's a reason there. Um, so, it, uh, but I'll comment that I'll comment on this by quoting from Matthew seven twenty eight. 
And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as one of their scribes. Interesting. I would also like to point out uh, a section in 2 Corinthians. Paul has something to say about this issue. And it's, it's, a li- it's a little lengthy, so please bear with me. I'm in 2 Corinthians 3, 4, going for uh, about 10 more verses after that. 2 Corinthians 3, 4. Paul says, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Yeah. So that's what Jesus was doing when he was quoting Moses. He was quoting the letter. But then when he said, But I say unto you, he was giving the spirit of the law. Okay? And I wish we had time to just go into uh, the sermon, or that part of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I'm actually, uh, there's so much I want to say, even in the next two weeks. I'm not even sure I can fit it in one of those other two weeks. So we may or may not be able to get to it, but, uh, but this is amazing. I just wanted to point out that Jesus is not only quoting Moses, who is obviously it's not Moses' words, it's the law. God gave it to Moses. But he's and he's not setting that aside. He's just saying, Look, there's this, but I say unto you this. Okay? So I'm gonna I'm gonna continue my reading in second Corinthians three. Uh, I'm gonna pick up here with verse seven. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? So he's talking, he's talking about the law who was given by God, and, and Moses literally etched it in stone. This is what Paul's talking about. Okay, I'm going to pick up um, in verse 10. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. Paul's saying, look, the law had glory, but now it has faded into the background because there's Jesus. Okay? Not anybody can do that. Jesus can, and he did. Okay? Um, So I'm going to pick up here uh, in verse 11. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, uh, much more will it will much more will what is uh, permanent have glory. So he's saying the law, again, the law wasn't permanent, but now that Jesus is here, he's permanent. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome at what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ it is taken away. So this is Paul's commentary, uh, not directly on the Sermon on the Mount, but thematically, it's it's right there. Paul's Paul's basically saying what Jesus is saying, just in a different way. Paul's a little bit more theological. Jesus is more personal. Um, So I want to, this is my way of saying, Jesus is a rebel. He's rebelling. And again, he's not rebelling against God. He's rebelling against what people have come to think about God. Sometimes if, if we... I don't know about you, but to be honest with you, I went through uh, an earlier period of my life in my 20s, part of my 20s, not attending church once. Uh, I mean, it was years. Uh, I didn't go to church once. I... I did honestly. I did read the Bible a good, quite a quite a bit, but I didn't interact with believers. I didn't interact with brothers or sisters. I didn't. Um, I just didn't put myself there, and uh, that yeah, that's part of my testimony. But because of that, I once 
once God was able to draw me back, once I, I, I came kind of back into the fold, as it were, I, I, di- I hadn't denied God, but I sort of I sort of denied all of my brothers and sisters. Which, you know, yeah, I mean, if you're not, if you're not interacting with brothers and sisters, going to church, attending services, attending Bible studies, worshiping with your brothers and sisters, if you're not doing that, you may not feel it, but you're fading away a little bit. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're, you're pulling away. And I believe it's, it's my, personal, uh, uh, my personal conviction that if, you, if that goes unchecked, uh, you're, you've just you've started to pull away from God altogether. Yeah, it leads to that. And so, uh, anyway, I, I don't want to necessarily go down that road, but this is this is sort of um, this is this is what Jesus is rebelling against. It's our attitudes about God. Sometimes, sometimes we have bad attitudes. It's our 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 wrong expectations about God. Um, so Jesus rebels against religious leaders and the letter of the law, and uh, we're yeah we're we're basically wrapping up here. Um, so I just wanted to kind of continue this this Jesus as a rebel in Matthew uh, twelve one. Um, this is the story. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open it up to Matthew twelve one, and you'll see that story. It goes on for about oh roughly eight verses. Um, this is a story where Jesus and the disciples are going through the field. And they're eating the heads of grain. But it's on the Sabbath. So technically, according to the Sabbath, they're working for their meal because they're, they're doing this. They're working according to... Now, not necessarily according to the commandment of the Sabbath, but the way, over the years, the way that the religious community has developed it. They said, you know, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Well, they've over the years, and over a few more years, and over a few more years, they decided as a re- religious community, the way to keep the Sabbath holy and honor the Sabbath is to just don't do anything. Well, then it became don't do any work, don't do any this. Practically, just stand there on the Sabbath. Uh, that's that's a little bit of a that's that's me exaggerating, but. The religious leaders, uh, who was it? The Pharisees, it says, uh, came to him and said, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Jesus basically said, um, well, it's kind of a long quote, but anyway, uh, Jesus said, in answer to that, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, uh, how he entered the house of God, the very house of God, the temple, and ate, well, not the temple at that time, but the tabernacle at that time, and ate the bread of the presence. That's not something that you're supposed to do. Either go in there or eat that bread. Um, Which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Okay? So Jesus continues by saying, Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is being a rebel. The Pharisees came to him and said, Hey, aren't you being a rebel? And Jesus said, Yes, but I'm not rebelling against God or the law. I'm rebelling against you your bad attitude and your bad expectations your 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 power and your control that you're trying to exert over the people with all this silly nonsense okay um, Jesus uh, and we're not going to probably have a lot of time here left but um, I just want to wrap up by saying that not only is Jesus rebelling against um, expectations Jesus rebels against the religious leaders and the letter of the law Jesus rebels against religious expectations. Uh, another hallmark uh, of Matthew is the parables. Okay, uh, There are parables in, I believe, every one of the four Gospels, but Matthew has quite a lot of them. And that's kind of what he's known for among people who are like biblical scholars and whatnot. So Jesus even shows how he's a rebel with the parables. 
because in Matthew 13 he says and the disciples came to him and said why do you speak to them in parables disciples are probably thinking why do you speak to them in parables because I can't understand them either you know well, and, and even they even came to him at one point. Uh, I believe it was later than that, and said, uh, "What do you mean by that parable?" So th- they're kind of coming on behalf of the people, saying, "Well, why do you speak to them in parables?" Jesus answered and said, "To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For t- to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance." but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing, they do not see, and hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. Again, this is something we could really just dive into. There's a lot to be said about that particular scenario. But but again, Jesus is being a rebel. They're coming to him saying, well, basically saying, we expect you to be plain with your talk. Why are you not being plain? Again, Jesus is saying, you're right, I'm rebelling, but I'm not rebelling against them, or my message, or God. I'm rebelling against your expectations of how I'm supposed to deliver that message. Uh, it wasn't just the disciples who were who were questioning Jesus about his parables. It was basically everybody at one point or another asked him, expressed, Jesus, why are you speaking in these stories? Um, so, uh, again, uh, boy, I wish we had time to read through that. But I, I would like to just kind of finish finish up here. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. Um, Jesus is a very unique person. We know that. Because he's not just human, he's God. He's so many things to us. If we were to just list them, it would be a two-hour worship service in and of itself. Okay? But I'm, I just wanted to point out one little facet of this big jewel that we have before us. One little facet that shines and sparkles. And it's Matthew's Gospel. He presents Jesus as a very unique person who is both a king, okay, but he's also a rebel. And yes, he is many other things. But Matthew sort of he kind of steps that up a little bit in his view of Jesus, of each one of those, I think. Uh, So there we have it. Jesus is a rebel. Uh, He's a king. He is fully both. Uh, He is the king we didn't expect or even know to look for. Uh, He is the king we need, however. And now that he has revealed himself to us, we realize that he is the king that we all secretly want in our hearts. Matthew takes us for a ride with twists and turns. Uh, His is a great story, but it's one we cannot sum up in one sermon, or even three of them that I have this month. But we'll try to get a better picture. Um, And this was my sort of my introduction to Matthew. And the next couple weeks we're going to get into it more. But I wanted to highlight Jesus as both a king whom we worship, whom whom we can worship, truly worship. But I wanted to present him as that rebel too, that sort of divine rebel. The good guy rebel. Okay? Because uh, I, maybe that's one of the reasons I like Matthew so much, because I kind of like those things about Jesus. I like the safety of knowing that I have a king who I can trust to rule my life. And rule the world, rule his plan for the world. When we have presidents and uh, presidential candidates come up, it's just a never-ending, every, and it's not just this time. So every four years we're like, okay, let's get the goods on this one. Let's get the goods on this one. Let's compare, let's contrast, let's do this, let's do that. It's because they're people, it's because they're human beings, and they're all, all they're going to rule is just our tiny little nation in our tiny little corner of the world. I'm not belittling um, our country, but what I'm saying, it, but what I am doing is putting it in perspective that I love that I have a king who I can trust to rule. I can just let it go and go, there you go, I will follow you, you take me there. 
The other thing I like is that Jesus kind of circumvents those expectations. You know, that we have those expectations, those religious power structures that are set up sometimes. And Jesus doesn't necessarily knock them down, but he just sort of walks around them, just like this, and sort of stands in front of them and says, you don't really need that. That's one of the things I really love about Jesus. And I wanted to make this not about Matthew, but I wanted to make this about a worship time of Jesus. And we can um, think about these things um, you know, in the next week, and we'll come back and we'll we'll get we'll get some more things from Matthew to worship Jesus about. But let's um, uh, just do that with me, would you, this week? Uh, think about Jesus as the King. Sometimes we blow over that because it's just, oh yeah, he's the King. He's the King of the Jews. Yeah, we know that. But sometimes we don't stop and go. We we don't just camp out there for a second and go. Wait a minute, he's a King. And he's my king. That's, that feels good. And that's worship right there when we think... That's one way we worship. We worship with music. We worship a lot of different ways. Another way we worship is we think about Jesus. And we, we meditate on that and allow Jesus to speak into our lives through that. So, thank you for uh, letting me go on for quite a while. I don't know if I've gone on too long or not, but I know it's it's plenty long enough, I think. So, thank you very much.